So um, I just uh, finished the lab module and published it or made the full, um, all the items available about 30 minutes before this session. So let me kind of walk you through it. Some of these pages were available earlier, but you might not have looked at it in detail and that's perfectly fine. There was no expectation that you would, uh, I mean, you should. Um, so most of the lab descriptions, all the information you need for the lab activity itself is here. And um, if we could uh, treat this like uh, just a free form game or just a fun activity, I could uh, simply leave it here. You could, I could uh, say, you know, do it or don't do it. I don't care. <laughs> um, all this is available to you. Make, <laughs> make of it what you will. I wish I could do that, um, but you know, this is an actual class and I have to actually create things. So, um, so, uh, so I can't do that, but that would be the kind of the ideal, um, kind of ideal form that we might pursue if it were possible, where all this material is here for someone who's just interested in physics, don't have to do any of this. You just are interested in heat energy cycles and you want some resources that will help you investigate it on your own, then, then this uh, will work great because it um, has some videos that demonstrate a working heat engine and it, um, it introduces the kind of bare minimum of theory, things that you need. So much of this hopefully will be a reminder, like ideal gas law, we covered it in chapter one, and because it, it'll be used a lot, it's here. First law of thermodynamics, that has been covered this week. That's a chapter three material. So it's timely. Um, and uh, PV diagrams, I think it, it was first introduced in chapter two. In chapter three, you use it more. So um, th this is also included here as a kind of bare minimum of theory. And same here with the name, the thermodynamic processes. So I'm trying to make this lab activity page kind of self-contained um, while it's not expected. Well, so you should be following along in the lecture. This week, you should be studying through chapter three. And uh, next week, when you are kind of uh, wrapping up this lab activity um, for the first round, you should be kind of working through that in between between chapter three and four. Uh, which is the week three module. Um, and um, also all of these are kind of repeats of those lecture content. The, um, the, so I guess none of this is new. That's kind of, that's a style of writing lab manual. So, and so none of that is new. Um, what is new here is how we are going to do the actual lab activity because you don't have the equipment and the kind of equipment you need for the types of lab in um, physics 4B, it's not something where I can ask you to assemble it from uh, materials you can find at home. Like some of that is doable in, if it's like physics 4A, but with the physics 4B, uh, there's, some, uh, pre there's some precision needed. There is some, um, um, I mean, like even the instructional equipment we have, my constant complaint is that they're not as high quality as the equipment that we use in the research setting. So, <laughs> so these equipment are already not high quality enough. So uh, I really don't think you would achieve the lab learning objectives if you are just doing it with materials you can find around your home. It's just not doable that way. So what I'm trying to do this semester is I recorded all the videos using the, um, using the apparatus that you would have used if you are in the lab here. So, um, the, so you know, there's descriptions here. You should kind of um, read around the descriptions and uh, all the videos all together. I think they are all about five, six minutes. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So all of them added probably adds up to about an hour. And I think it's a good idea, good idea for you to just watch through it once, just to see what is in the video. And for some of them, you will have to watch more than once because as you are looking through the video, you will see 
things that show you the information you will need for actual numerical measurement and analysis. So, um, so this video thing is the new thing that we are doing and I don't know how well it would work because it hasn't been tried before. I hope it works well and whatever isn't working, let me know. And um, because this semester, I don't have the option of saying, you know, forget about the lab because <laughs> um, the entire semester is online. So we do have to do the lab. So I will make whatever changes I need to make to make this work. Um, so yeah, I won't go through all the sections in detail. Um, let's see, uh, just to highlight some things. Um, so, so I do provide example calculation. I um, had to do it for really two reasons. Uh, one is uh, I had to kind of prove to myself that the videos I recorded did provide enough information for actual measurement and calculation. And you see in these three examples with how I'm taking actual measurements from the videos. So, you know, this is not really a measurement per se, it's just the reading of the numbers that's re written on the um, apparatus. But um, screenshots like this is what demonstrates the kind of measurement that you are making. And it is a real measurement. The only thing that is not real is um, that you are not the one who physically touched these pistons and physically placed this aluminum can in the tap water. Um, but, you know, if you're kind of a student who likes to come to the lab and, you know, fully participate, but you don't like uh, touching the equipment, you're just watching your classmates and you're just looking, then this video provides almost the equivalent uh, experience. And what you can see here is that uh, for this particular situation at this particular moment, moment in the video, so you have to watch the video to see what led to this point. Um, the key major numerical measurement here is the position of the piston. Uh, you always read this piston at the bottom because uh, when the bottom is at the lowest, that's where you read it zero. So I read it at 96 millimeters and that's reading the height of the piston. And I use the number in the calculation here. The height of the piston is at 96 millimeters and that's used to calculate the volume and once I have the volume and I have some way to make a tight minor adjustments to the pressure, then I can do the calculation that I set out to do, uh, calculate the number of molecules in the heat engine apparatus. And um, so I did these example calculations for one reason to you know, prove to myself <laughs> that this new thing we are trying has some chance of working, um, at least um, for people who know the physics content, me. <laughs> and uh, the second reason is some of these calculations are fairly involved and I don't just want to throw you to the walls and you know, leave you to survive on your own. Um, I, you know, in an in-person lab, this is the kind of thing where I could have paused either, I could have done a mini lecture in the lab or I could have, um, done this demonstration for each group individually. Um, and since there isn't that level of interactivity with online lab, um, I'm providing some of these example calculations so that you can see in the exact context of the lab, how these detailed calculations are done. I hope I write out enough description here that the equations I write down, the numbers I write down make some sense. Uh, you know, if any part of it doesn't make sense, write me a message. Either I will clarify it or, you know, write it a little bit clearer or try to answer your question. But so that's uh, the, the second reason these example calculations are provided, that uh, there are some very detailed uh, quantitative tasks that you need to be able to perform for the lab. And um, I want to make sure that everyone has the resource available to and to bring you bring yourself up to speed. Um, yeah. Now, when it comes to the directions for the lab, where you know I will note that it's actually um, very much smaller part of the instructions. Um, I want to high. Uh, so this question came up just before the 
lab session started and um, I, I want to highlight the difference between what you might be more familiar with in a face-to-face -face lab. It's sometimes referred to as like a recipe style lab where you have basically step-by-step -step instructions and you're just working through it. And that's a, what, I, what our normal lab used to be. And I actually had a plan to reform that eventually, just not this year, but whatever. Um, so let me just put them side by side so that you can compare them. This is the lab that uh, this particular activity is based on. And this is the lab manual that we used to for like four or five years, um, just when I was faculty here and probably many years before then. And actually we borrowed this lab from UC Berkeley. So it, it's a good lab, <laughs> um, no, nothing against it. But this is a kind of, an, um, it has uh, many elements of it that are that recipe style lab. Um, it's a kind of, um, it's a linear, uh, you start at the top, you read it through the introduction, go through all the instructions, you know, do the pre-lab equipment to check. And really what you have to make sure to do as you're going through the lab is read the questions and answer the question. Question one, question two, question three, and so on. Um, and, you know, write the answers on some separate paper. And um, once you reach the additional questions at the end, questions 10 and 11, you answer them. And, you know, for most groups, it takes about two to three hours for them to do all this. And once you answer those, you turn that in, you're done. That was okay in the normal in-person lab. It, 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 it wasn't the best, but it was a serviceable. And uh, part of that was, well, you know, we have 12 of those labs. So uh, what we are trying to get out of a single lab is not the same thing as what we are trying to get out of a single lab here. So that's one. And two, this lab has some parts that are embedded that you might not be able to guess their importance just from reading it. But there are parts where uh, it's embedded to the parts where I force interaction between the lab groups and myself. And uh, where there are these parts is because either one, I need to make sure people understand what they're doing, or two, there are some specific questions I want to ask that's not actually written into the lab manual. Because you know, how I ask the question depends on what level of understanding the group demonstrates. So in an in-person lab, this very linear recipe style lab, it works fine because there is a level of interactivity that kind of covers for any uh, flaws in the lab design itself. And while I'm not saying that this lab is better designed, um, I'm not saying that. I am saying that this particular style will not work for online lab. There's just too much that you will miss out on. There's um, there's too much nuance that people will not catch on as you are just answering one question at a time. So, so when you look at the, to, uh, this semester's lab activity, um, you will see that I don't really provide you with direct uh, instructions on what to do next. It's up to you to figure that out. What I do provide are all the tools and some general goal. There is really one goal for this lab, which is design and analyze heat engine cycles. It's a simple goal, but it's like, you know, it's like saying, go out and be successful. What does being successful mean? Um, what does analyzing heat engine cycle mean? And, um, and sometimes I see this uh, approach from students where you just want a clear instruction so that you can do it and be done with. And that's an approach that could work okay for this in-person lab. It simply won't work in the online lab. At least I, I mean, it won't allow uh, the class to achieve the learning objectives for the lab. So, so there isn't some one clear thing I'm telling you, do this and then move on because my hope is that you are not moving on. You are drilling down. You are further investigating. That's what you should be doing. So I provide a primary objective, but you know, it's very vague. <laughs> Reading it, you might not 
even if you read through everything above this, you might not really get what this even means. So I did provide some preliminary investigations, and I think these should be simple enough that you can kind of read it, have some idea of what it is that you should be doing, and do it. And I am hoping as you are doing it, you are learning something, and that something you are learning will help you kind of understand what's involved in designing and analyzing heat engine cycles. So um, there's three of these, preliminary, this, yeah, preliminary investigation, one, two, and three. And the third one really leads into actually designing and analyzing heat engine cycle. So, um, so yeah, it kind of ends here and um, it's uh, up to you to <laughs> make this lab your own and um, kind of do the investigation and uh, come back to me with the questions um, and kind of come back to me with the questions and um, and do that. So th I set up some things logistically that I think will um, help do this, which is, um, so this is the one lab we are doing for the entirety of thermodynamics. So, um, so in this one lab activity, I'm hoping you understand everything you need to understand in thermodynamics, the first to four weeks of this class. Um, so it, there's much more time set aside for this lab. And this is uh, kind of the rough plan for this lab. Um, so, so today is the first two week, you just got the instructions. And next week, September 9th, uh, we will hold that as the first uh, follow-up observation slash measurement session. So, um, so I was saying before that uh, the, the videos that you see recorded here, I'm hoping that this covers about 80 to 90% of the information that you need. Um, and if you feel like you can't find some information, you should message me, ask me, you know, how do I find this? If it's something that you can do within available videos, then I will tell you. Um, so, right. Um, but I know enough from experience, having been, you know, uh, academic researcher in experimental physics for too many years, um, that the first time you measure things, you don't think of everything. And I'm really hoping some of you will think of some questions that I didn't imagine when I was making these videos. So there will be some things that simply were not captured in recording. Then um, that's what the time next two week, uh, I hope will be for. So next, uh, uh, so September 9th, we will uh, meet at six and the uh, the first item on the agenda will be okay. What um, information are you looking for to complete your lab activity that um, there's no video resource to use to complete it. Then um, that's the time when I'll be making additional measurement. And actually in about five to 10 minutes, I will show you how that'll work. I kind of set up something outside in the lab. Um, I'll show you how that, uh, that'll work. So, um, so, so next week, we are still on the same lab, but at that point, you should have uh, done something on your own with your lab partner, some level of uh, analysis, some level of uh, working through the lab, uh, thinking through the lab, uh, generating questions that you need to answer. And, um, and September 9th is when we will um, we'll address the first round of questions. And September 16th is when I have your, the first draft of the lab report to do. Um, so the, the due date here is the due date for the uh, first draft. And um, I'm kind of um, utilizing this a feature of Canvas, which is that the way, especially the way I set up the assignments, one, it'll allow for unlimited submissions. So um, once you submitted it, you can also resubmit it. Two, um, and this is the way I set it up, it will also allow for late submissions. So uh, by the due date, you should turn in your first draft. 
I'll try to grade it quickly and get it back to you. And unless you did it perfectly, <laughs> then, um, then uh, you should plan on revising it and resubmitting it. And you know, Canvas will mark it as late, but it's not really late. Um, so, so yeah, it, September 16th is when you will be turning in your first uh, uh, lab report draft. And that's when kind of most people should be mostly done. There might be some things you need to go back to and fix maybe. Um, and I'm hoping by September 23rd, we can start on electrostatics lab. So, so counting today, we have a minimum of three lab sessions set aside for this lab activity and we'll see how it goes. Uh, next week is the first chance that we'll have to kind of um, catch up and um, we see where everyone is at and make sure that it's, um, <laughs> not make sure, check if it's working the way I imagined it would work. And if it's not, then we need to start making adjustments and we'll make the adjustments that we need to make. Um, let's see here. Now, as you are going through the lab investigation, um, so you know, it's a, so that's a kind of what the point of this comparison was. It's hard for me to be very prescriptive with this lab because it's supposed to be a self-guided inquiry and investigation. Like every instruction I give you is kind of a micromanagement and <laughs> micromanagement is never good management. <laughs> so um, it, it's very difficult to, for me to be prescriptive in a productive way here. So um, the information I'm, the guidance I'm giving you, instead of a prescription on how you should do this lab, uh, I'm providing you with the models. Uh, that's, that's actually why this model I, uh, module item is uh, the ver very first lab uh, module item. Because I actually do want you to start from here. I don't want you to start from here. Because even though this contains all the information for the actual lab activity, um, the kind of the goal of lab is to get you to think like a physicist, think like an engineer. And um, th there is, the best way I know how to illust how to do that is to show you what real physicists, real engineers do. And what real physicists do is they do their experiments and write peer reviewed journal articles. So on this page is where I explain all that and provide you with some examples of actual journal articles. Um, these are so American Journal of Physics, it's published by American Association of Physics Teachers. So it is education oriented. They are not covering cutting edge physics research that deals with you know, quantum mechanics, general relativity, quantum field theory. They are not doing that. Um, they are you know, analysis of, of a model race car. It's a very simple situation. But what I hope you will be able to see is to the level of depth they go into when a real scientist actually investigates a phenomenon that's worth investigating, like a model race car. That, you know, it's a simple situation, but it's worth investigating. So when you read this article, you will kind of see the level of thinking that goes into uh, um, um, actual research activity, which is what we are modeling after. Um, and so some things that I want to kind of caution you about the biggest thing is really the equations, um, which I kind of alluded to somewhere here. I usually skip the equations. <laughs> so as you're reading this, if you're skipping equations, that's fine. That's how I read it, at least the first to read. Um, I, I pay closer attention to the equations once I realize, oh, I need to understand what they are. <laughs> but you know, read through it. And as you're reading through it, you can kind of see the thinking process. It talks about design elements. It talks about what kind of considerations they had to give to their race car design to, you know, be the winning, uh, winningest uh, derby car or whatever. Um, and there's some discussion of friction, and they have some uh, measurement of parameters of friction coefficient or whatever, and they describe some uh, measurement setup, and so, so. 
while your lab report won't be as detailed as actual peer-reviewed journal articles, mainly because you're, you don't have as much time to spend, it, but this is the model. This is something that I hope, you know, in about, I guess, for some of you in about three, two, three, four years, you might be in graduate school, you might be writing articles like this in two, three, four years. So um, I want you to kind of uh, look at this as a kind of a goal as, a, um, as it relates to the level of detail, level of thoroughness, a level of depth of the investigation that you should at least think about doing. And you, know, and you might come across some obstacles. The first thing you should do when there's an obstacle is send me a message. We'll try to work it through and I might agree with you, okay, this will take too much time to nail down, let's move on. So <laughs> that's something that we get to do in instructional lab that you wouldn't do in a research lab. So, um, but this is the kind of um, the summit that you're trying to uh, aim at. So here's, this is one example. And you know, the thing about examples is you need a few to kind of get a range of, um, quality and um, differences, variations. So I provided three articles here. Uh, I can provide more. They've been publishing for many decades. Uh, if uh, I guess um, it helps me to provide more examples if uh, there's something specific, uh, some, I, if you have some idea of what you're looking for. But what I want, do want to say is that I'm happy to provide additional more, additional examples. So do kind of skim through these three articles to get a sense of what's uh, expected in a lab report. And um, hopefully having read it through these articles, you get a sense of what's expected. And this is kind of uh, my summary on what the structure should look like. Introduction is, uh, it's kind of important. Uh, it, it, um, so it's important both for the actual journal articles and it's important for us. Uh, in, it's in your writing of introduction that I uh, will get some glimpse of how much of the theory you understood or how much of the point of the lab you understood. If you have poor introduction, then I'm forced to assume that you didn't understand it very well. If you have good introduction, then you know it's consistent with a good understanding of what's covered in the lab. Um, and the rest of the section, they tend to be more free flowing. Uh, this is kind of one default breakdown you could use, but as you will see in these examples, the journal articles don't necessarily follow this. It, you kind of do what seems most natural. Um, so yeah, yeah that's the, maybe I should have, uh, let me change the module requirement for this and make it markers done. I feel like that's more, appropriate for this item. I had, had it as view, but um, because uh, the, there's a different meaning for me between view and mark has done. Mark has done means uh, you uh, take responsibility for knowing the material in it. And it does have kind of um, with the encouragement for you to do this. And when you mark it as done, uh, what it means to me is that you've done this or at least you take responsibility for having done it or should have done it. Um, before I show you some of the lab logistics setup, especially for the follow-up lab observation measurement, let me just end this portion with um, the showing of the lab report rubric. I think that'll give you some clearest or <laughs> most direct um, um, communication in terms of what's expected for the lab report, because I'm very circumspect in saying what I expect in this lab activity, once again, because I'm trying to avoid being prescriptive. Um, so in the rubric for the lab report is where you will see my expectation. Um, so it comes, it's broken down into thri three criteria. Uh, you should uh, um, read it through it to make sure you understand. So I'm going to be grading introduction separately. Uh, I'm almost going to be grading introduction as like its own essay. And it will be graded out of the five point holistic grading rubric. It, the description of that rubric is on the syllabus. 
Um, five means excellent understanding. It goes all the way down to one, no understanding for people who only submitted something. Um, so some range here. Um, so I'm kind of scoring your essay. That's what that amounts to. So do take care in writing your introduction. And one hint for writing introduction, it's usually the section that you write the last because it's usually after you've done all the measurements, done all the thinking, asked all the questions that you fully understand what the experiment is about. So even though me as a reader will read the introduction first, you as writer should be writing it last. Just, that's just how it works out best. The other two rubric items refer to, um, um, refer to the rest of the lab, kind of what investigation you have done, what um, descriptions you give, and so on. And that's where, once again, it's a very difficult to, for me to be prescriptive in a way that's not counter inter, counterproductive, meaning it's actually productive. Um, so um, I'm so so it's uh, in two categories. One is basically about thoroughness. And this is where um, it gets at the heart of what I'm being very circumspect about, as in I'm giving you all this information, I'm giving you some general primary objective, and I am giving you a great deal of freedom here. And the thing about freedom is that um, you can use it in a very good way, and you can use it also in a very bad way. You can choose to interpret design and analyze uh, heat engine cycles in a way it minimizes the amount of work for you. I mean, it wouldn't be real freedom if you couldn't do that. So you can do it, that's your freedom. And what I'm communicating to you is that I do grade you on thoroughness. So if you decided to do what minimizes the amount of work for you, if that's your primary consideration, then I'm fully justified in giving you one out of three, at least in this category. Although, um, you know, thoroughness and quality are kind of connected. So it's not, um, so you can't have something that's not thorough and somehow shows excellent understanding. So, um, but I, I'm hoping by setting this out that I'm communicating clearly that uh, I want you to be thorough. And the part of the aspect of being thorough is including both the aspects explicitly spelled out in the lab activity description. And there are some things that I'm hoping you will figure out on your own. So there are aspects that are not explicitly spelled out on purpose. I could have written it in and I chose not to because me writing it in will kind of ruin the experience of the lab investigation. And you sh I I'm not expecting you to figure out all of them. Um, you know, you don't have the decades of experience with the physics that I do. But um, I want you to figure out some of them. And as you dig deeper into the lab, uh, lab activity, you will find some of them. And uh, that's what being thorough means. And, and yeah, that's what being thorough means. And uh, kind of the overall quality of the lab, it's again graded on the five point holistic grading scale. And um, you know, if you put in any kind of effort and do, um, decent work on the lab report, uh, like minimum you should get is three out of five. Like I, if I'm giving you two out of five or one out of five down here, then I am very upset with you and I'll probably follow up with you on one-on-one -on -one to see what, where you are going, or not one-on-one, -on -one, two-on-one, -on -one because you should be working with your lab partner. Um, so I'll follow up with your, with your group and try to figure out where it's going wrong and try to fix it. Um, so kind of the minimum score you should expect to get is three out of five if you're putting in good faith effort. And I hope to be able to give four out of five and five out of five to as many groups, uh, well, as many people as possible. Um, yeah. And the kind of the one weird thing I probably should say out loud is um, how this should be submitted. I've done group assignments in the past. Um, about a year ago, physics 4A, not in the spring, but in the fall semester. And some people were not doing the group assignments in good faith, as in one person was doing all the work, submitting things for the group, and later on I found out there was no group discussion at all. So um, 
th the way this is set up, it's not set up as a group assignment. It's set up as, uh, you know, I unchecked the group assignment. It's not group assignment. It's not set up that way in Canvas. But what I'm expecting is that you are working together with your lab partner. And when you turn in uh, your lab reports, they should be essentially identical lab reports. Now, you know, in under normal circumstances, that would be ch like cheating. And so that's why I'm highlighting it here for the lab report that is not cheating. That is exactly what I recommend that you do. Um, because, and they should be essentially identical lab reports because you worked together and it's a joint work product. And, uh, and you still have freedom to be different. And as I'm grading the lab report, if I see significant differences, I'll probably reach out to your group to see, oh, because uh, to me, what that means is both two of you didn't agree with each other on some conclusions or whatever. So, you know, it's worth hearing it out and um, see if I can help. <laughs> um, but so you should be working with your lab partner and even though this is set up as individual lab report assignment, so each lab partner should be turning in their own lab report. And I expect them to be essentially identical lab reports that you worked together. Um, so, all right, I think that's a kind of all the descriptions for this lab module that's been set up. So let me demonstrate for today um, how I imagine the follow-up observation measurement to work. So for me to do that, so this computer, this whole setup here, it's very difficult to move. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to join this session on a separate um, device on my phone. So you will see a second Enduro Park soon. And, um, and I will walk out into the lab room out there and kind of show you what the setup will be like when we do the follow-up measurement. So let me uh, set it up here. Let's say I need to be able to join this meeting here. Uh, let me do that on the phone. And I'm gonna, as I'm doing that, as, uh, like for half a second, I'm going to be, muting myself, otherwise there's a terrible feedback that'll occur. Um, all right, so as I'm joining, I'm gonna disconnect my audio on the computer. Sorry, I was saying something and yeah, I was muted. So <laughs> while I was muted, what I was saying was, um, <laughs> well, what you saw me just to do. Um, so that, that I'm going to uh, unshare my screen and spotlight this uh, cell phone video so that um, this video is what you mainly see. Uh, my, I know my video is still on, on the computer because I'm coming back here eventually. <laughs> Yeah, so that's all I was saying. I wasn't saying anything important. So let me just walk out to the uh, lab room and uh, show you what the setup looks like for doing the follow-up measurement, the follow-up stuff. Um, so, you know, we are not actually doing that today. I'm hoping we'll be able to do some of that, um, some of that uh, um, uh, next week. So let me just switch the camera that I'm using. So this is um, kind of a mock setup. Well, uh, this is a kind of mock setup that I set up for, um, well, set up for what it might be if I, uh, I'm preparing for next week. So this is the heat engine apparatus that um, you either already, oops, sorry, I need to, uh, either you have already seen in the video or um, 
whatever. And I don't have any, you know, any of the stuff that would be here if I'm actually making measurements, you know, water or whatever, but I'll have this set up, uh, uh, set up for the next week. And I also have this um, uh, camera stand so that, sorry, it's gonna be very dizzy for a little bit. But um, so, you know, when I'm actually doing this, there will be an actual camera stand so that it's fairly, the quality is acceptable. And uh, the rest, you know, uh, when we're doing follow-up observation, I probably won't be using the camcorder. This is what I used to record a portion of the video, but probably won't be using that. Um, I'll have some hot water prepared in case we need that. And really the uh, point of the follow-up um, point, really the point of the follow, oh, sorry, I'm trying to switch my video and is it switching? Okay, um, point of the follow-up measurement, uh, follow-up observation session would be, I can kind of respond in real time with what, um, with, sorry, I'm on my mobile and trying to figure out, okay. <laughs> that I'll be able to respond in real time and uh, fill in the gaps in whatever measurements that are there. Um, because once again, my expectation is not that in the recorded videos, I have captured 100% of the information that everyone needs. And I'm really hoping that some of you, as you are going through the lab investigation, you will come up with a question that I didn't anticipate as I was recording the lab videos. So, so that's a, how this session will kind of go uh, next week. I'll have this, you know, actually, so I'll have this actually, sorry, the phone is very, so I'll have this actually prepared. I'll um, be ready to um, uh, fulfill whatever requests people have on in terms of observation. Um, I'll, it would be nice to have some of them ahead of time, but you know that's not a requirement. Um, it's a it's a real time session, so whatever requests the pe people have in real time, my goal is to um, um, meet those requests. So let me just uh, switch to my computer here um, and um, and kind of wrap up this uh, lab. Um, portion. So let's see, let me stop highlighting, uh, stop spotlighting my cell phone video. And let me, hmm. so <laughs> I'll remember to do this this time. I'm going to leave the Zoom session from my uh, cell phone and then remember to join audio from my computer before I start saying stuff. Okay. Okay, I think everything's back to normal. Um, so, do I want to spotlight my own video again or gallery view, maybe? Yeah. Anyways, uh, so yeah, that's uh, kind of uh, how it's set up. Let me go back to sharing my screen. Um, let's see. Yeah, so I think that covers all of the agenda item one. Overview of lab, heat engine cycle, including the plan for the next couple of weeks, working on this lab activity. This portion will be recorded, just did that. Um, any questions people have that you might want to ask on recording? If not, let me stop the recording here and um, because this portion there's uh, no, oh, how many pages do you want the report to be? The answer is there is no answer for that because <laughs> it, it's a part of the prescription, but you can kind of look at the examples here. Uh, when you look at these models that I provide, you will see that they are not overly long and it's kind of, uh, um, this type of technical writing is a genre of writing and it, one of the goal in this type of writing is to be economical. You don't want, if there's something you can say in half a page, you don't want to stretch it out to two pages. That's a poor technical writing. So um, this is kind of two column format. Usually a single column would be a single page or in a normal kind of size, the font. A single column would be not a full page, maybe two thirds of a page um, or 
well, so counting, just looking at the page numbers without correcting for the font size or whatever. This first article, um, so the real article actually starts on page two. So it's a five page article. And I think it's excellent, well detailed. So there's a five, excellent five page article. And it's in fact, the last page is not full page. So excellent four page article. And if you look at this example here, it's a, uh, um, so not counting the first page. So it's, uh, uh, let me see what the last page looks like. Yeah, the last, so that's even up an appendix. So ignoring the appendix. So there's a six real pages here. It's an excellent six page article. And uh, this last one. But by the way, if I'm actually studying these articles and you know being thorough in understanding it, a single paper here could take me all day to making sure I understand the mathematical equations and I kind of agree with author's analysis of their own data or whatever. But what I'm trying to um, emphasize here is that it's not the length you should be looking for. It's the depth in the content. You, because you can frankly write 50 pages saying basically nothing at all. Or you can write one or two pages of a very insightful lab report. So the length of page is almost irrelevant. So this one, um, this uh, one is longer, partly because um, they are actually describing a lab that they are proposing is doable as an instructional lab. So they are uh, both kind of providing a lab manual and um, uh, doing their own kind of uh, uh, their own performance of their own proposed lab. So it's like two things in one. And in this very detailed work, they do this in about one, two, yeah, the last, that's just code and appendixes. So uh, not including those, this is an excellent uh, six page, uh, you know, page two through seven, six page article. So, so once again, it's a, this is a style that's uh, very unfamiliar to people because I think you are, you would almost rather have me say, uh, um, write a 10 page report because then you have some assurance that, oh, I wrote 10 pages, I'm done, good. And it's because I exactly don't want you to do that, that I'm not giving you a page number. I don't want you to write 10 pages and then think to yourself, oh, I did this thoroughly. You might not have. So the, so to get at what I mean by a thorough investigation, really the thing to do is look at this rubric here. And, um, and you can do a thorough lab report uh, in two pages. That is actually possible. Um, single spaced, not double spaced. And you have to be careful, but, um, but because I don't want you to uh, fool yourself into thinking many number of pages are either high quality or somehow complete. I don't, that's why I don't want to give a page number because you could do, uh, uh, yeah. So any other questions on the lab? Um, I want to have, you know, reserve enough time for actually forming lab partners. So if there are no more questions on the, Lab. And you know, we have three weeks as a minimum of two additional lab sessions set aside for this lab. So if some questions come up as you are working on the lab uh, next week, it's an excellent time to bring it up. And, and then the lab report will be due the week after. So, uh, so if there are any burning questions, I would love to answer them now. If not, um, let me stop the recording here. I think we probably have a couple of people in the class who are not in this session. So goodbye to those people who might be watching this recording later. And I do like people to stay on and uh, kind of form lab partners now if, uh, uh, if, if you can, because whoever doesn't have lab partner at the end of this session, I will do it by administrative fiat.